Hello, everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about the hedonism, hedonism of Epicur Epicurus. Uh, so let us begin. Uh, so hedonism, what is that? Well, it's the view that pleasure and pleasure alone is valuable. Uh, nothing in life is worth having other than the subjective feeling of, pers uh, of pleasure. Uh, so that's the heart of hedonism. Here's how Epicurus puts it. Uh, quote, we maintain the pleasure as the beginning and end of the blessed life. We recognize it as our primary and natural good. Pleasure is our starting point whenever we choose or avoid anything. And it is this we make our aim, using feeling as the criterion by which we judge every good thing. So there's an obvious subjective element to this view, right? That is the subjective feeling. If pleasure feels a particular way. And uh, the having of that pleasure, that feeling is good and nothing else is good. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if you feel it, you know it, you can, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, introspectively available. So it's subjective in that sense, you know it when you feel it and you know when we don't. However, the theory is actually an objective theory. Uh, and by that, I mean that uh, it claims that if you think you're happy, your life is worth living, but you're in pain, uh, this theory says you're mistaken. Uh, so it's not that your beliefs or what you think about what is good is grounding what is good for you, right? You have no authority whatsoever in deciding what's good for you. Uh, you have you know, access to your own feelings and then you can tell whether or not you feel pleasure or not. And uh, uh, if you feel pain, you're objectively miserable. If you feel pleasure, you're objectively happy. And that's it, right? It, it's grounded in your feelings, but it's not, it's an objectivist theory. It claims that reality is such that those that experience pleasure are happy and those that experience pain are miserable. So it's an objectivist theory in that regard. Uh, here are some more details. Uh, for Epicurus, Epicurus uh, pleasure alone is valuable. Nothing else is valuable but pleasure. And all pleasures are good. Uh, it's just by definition, that's the starting point of his thinking. Um, importantly, pleasure, the feeling is valuable independently of the activity that gives rise to the feeling and independently of the object of the activity that is giving rise to the feeling. Uh, so in this picture, there's the, someone singing. Uh, and if he derives pleasure out of singing and if the people that are listening derive pleasure out of hearing it, it is good for him and it is good for them, regardless of whether the singing is good singing uh, or whether the activity of singing is worthwhile, whether the song that he's playing is beautiful, like all of those considerations outside of the feeling are just irrelevant for assessing the goodness or badness of those activities. It is the pleasure that they have that makes them good for them and the pain that they have that makes it bad for them. The activity in question doesn't matter. The object of the activity doesn't matter. Um, uh, this does not mean, however, that Epicurus recommends a life of unrestricted indulgence and pleasure. Um, so you might think that someone who thinks everything I've said so far might recommend a life of seeking pleasures, right? Like seeking thrills, you know, having a lot of sex, having a, like going to parties as much as possible, seeking, you know, going to adventures, things like that. It, it's someone who's a daredevil in different ways, who seeks like the adrenaline and things like that. You might think Epicurus is, Epicurus is going to go in that direction. Uh, but he's actually not going to go in that direction. Uh, he's going to, he points out to begin with that sometimes maximizing, maxima, maximizing pleasure at the moment might lead to pain in the future. So if you are glutton or slothful, you know, if you really like eating, you sit down and eat this whole piece of cake. Uh, that may give you a lot of pleasure as you're eating the huge piece of cake. But, you know, a little bit afterwards, you're not going to feel that well. You get the, like the sugar, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not going to make your body, so much sugar is not going to make your body feel well shortly afterwards. And, and Epicurus thinks, well, maximizing pleasure is the way of doing things, but that doesn't mean uh, uh, doing it per moment, right? That's foolish. You should maximize pleasure in the long run. You should use your reason to think about how to go about acting in such a way that you maximize pleasure in the long run. And having a huge piece of cake might not be the right way of doing so. Why? Well, the pleasure is fine, but then you're going to feel painful and miserable afterwards. Then you should think about your whole life, not just that particular moment. So, uh, for Epicurus, the mind does play an important role in the happy life, uh, but it is, but its function is to anticipate and recollect the pleasure of the senses. 
It is the pleasures of the senses or the bodily pleasures that are your happiness. And to the extent that reason is involved, reason is involved in just thinking about how to maximize those bodily pleasures, much in like, like in the example of the cake I just gave you. You use your reason to assess how to maximize the quantity of pleasure you experience. And you realize if I get a lot of cake now, I get a lot of pleasure now, but then there's going to be this consequence that I'm not going to like, and you know, my health is going to go downhill and so on. So I shouldn't do it. But the reason you shouldn't do it uh, is not because gluttony itself is bad, or but it's because the pleasure in your life is going to be diminished in the long run. So how does one do this? How does one maximize pleasure in the long run throughout one's life? Uh, here's a perhaps surprising recommendation that Epicurus makes. This maximization of pleasure in the wrong, long run requires a life of sobriety that is not drunkenness. Uh, honor, justice, and virtue, uh, and wisdom. So Epicurus actually recommends that you be a virtuous agent. And uh, he thinks that is the way of going about maximizing pleasure. So it's important to realize that Epicurus recommends a life of, of virtue, but he thinks that the life of pleasure is one that enables you to manage better the having of pleasures in the long run. It maximizes pleasures in the wrong, long run. So the value that the virtues have, like honor, justice, wisdom, for Epicurus is merely instrumental, it's pure, purely for the sake of maximizing bodily pleasure and securing them in the long run. Uh, that's what, what Epicurus thinks. So he does recommend the virtuous life, but as a way of, as the best strategy for maximizing pleasure in the long run. Uh, and he goes farther. Here's an interesting observation from the, from the book. A simple vegetarian diet in the company of a few friends in a modest garden suffices for Epicurean happiness. And part of the vegetarian diet is the abstaining from more kind of extravagant uh, banquets. So refraining, refraining, uh, refraining from participating in the more extravagant ban banquets uh, is the simpler kind of pleasure. But doing that in the long run, uh, says uh, Epicurus, uh, would maximize the quantity of pleasure you have because of the possible you know, bad consequences of having a lot of banquets. Also, have few friends. Uh, a lot of people can get complicated. You increase the chances of things going wrong and, and so on. And have a modest car and don't look for a big estate. Don't, be, you know, don't look for big things. Make your life simple. Uh, and again, this is one of those recommendations that sounds pretty weird. Like, why would you, if your goal is to maximize happiness, so, and happiness is pleasure, why would you make go for a simple life? And here is the main observation that uh, Epicurus makes. Uh, because minimizing pain is just as valuable as maximizing pleasure. Pleasure is the greatest good, he thinks. And by the same token, pain is the greatest evil. And this kind of minimal life, you know, simple diet, virtuous, a uh, few friends, uh, and not very ambitious in terms of model, uh, wealth acquisition and things like that, that is great at minimizing pain. So your life is simple. It's so you avoid all of the complexities that almost inevitably give rise to frustration, sadness, and misery. So you get rid of a lot of the complexity of it. Look for a simple life. Why? Primarily because it's the best way of minimizing pains while retaining pleasure, a large portion of the pleasure. And Epicurus is going to say that the pleasures retain actually the most important ones. So let's let's look a little more a little more about his details. He makes an important distinction between natural pleasures and non-natural or futile pleasures. Uh, and here's what he writes. And this is Epicurus himself. Uh, quote, we have natural desires for the removal of the painful states of hunger, thirst, and cold. And the satisfaction of these desires is naturally pleasant. So pleasure is the satisfaction of desires. And importantly, he thinks we have these very natural fundamental desires. And the satisfaction of those is one of the best pleasures in life. So the strongest and most fundamental of all the desires is the desire to be free from pain. So being free from pain is itself one of the greatest pleasures in life. So this kind of life of contentment and peace, peace of mind, grounded in bodily satisfaction, not extravagance, but satisfaction, is kind of the most great pleasure in life. The having of that throughout your life. If you have it for a couple of hours, it's great. But planning your life in such a way that you minimize the quantity of like adventures and things you do and that make your life unnecessarily complicated 
uh, is the way to go because one of the most important desires is the desire to be free from pain, free from you know starving, free from uh, cold, thirst, and so on. Just maintaining bodily kind of uh, satisfaction gives rise to this mental state of peace and that way of being in the long run is the happiest life a human can live. So he makes a distinction in natural desires and some are temporary, right? When you're hungry, you eat, there's this pleasure that comes with the satiation of hunger, which is a natural pleasure because hunger is a natural desire. Uh, and that's fine, but he is really after what he calls the permanent natural desires. And those are the, not, not merely the immediate temporary kind of satisfaction of hunger, but rather this general satisfaction of not being in a state of hunger. Uh, in other words, not, not being worried about, you know, not having enough to eat at the table and things like that, but rather just surrounding yourself in a small garden, some place where you have access to food, such that if you feel a little hungry, you go and eat a little bit. And so, so, so you maintain this kind of general state in which hunger is not a threat. When you have, and that, when you satisfy the desire of having the stability of being able to, you know, quench your thirst, satisfy your hunger, uh, not be exposed to the cold, you know, small house and things like that. Once you have those basic necessities taken care of, uh, and you are contented with that, our, uh, uh, Epicurus thinks that's the happy life, that's the contented life, that's the one that is the best bet for minimizing pain and retaining the kind of pleasure that is the satisfaction of these basic desires. That's the good life. Uh, so you might think that sex would be a big thing for someone who wishes for hedonism, but Epicurus does not think so. Here's something that book says is pretty informative. Sexual pleasure, he said, could be taken in, one, uh, uh, in any way one wished, provided one respected the law in convention, uh, distressed no one, and did no damage to one's body or one's essential resources. However, these qualifications add up to substantial constraint, sexual constraint. And even when sex did no harm, it did no good either. So like, that's an extreme thing to say, right? Uh, someone who thinks that pleasure is the good in life, uh, does not think that sex adds that much to your life. Why? Well, guess the state of pleasure he's after is the satisfaction of the desire to be free from pain and the desire to be free from hunger and like just have this bodily stability and engaging in sexual activity gives you pleasure, but doesn't really contribute to that fundamental like contentment with life. Uh, and he thinks that many times getting involved in like kind of romantic relationships may lead to frustration, dissatisfaction, and, and there's a lot of like pitfalls in terms of pain involved with the sexual activity that all things being equal, like he does not think is worth it, uh, namely engaging in sexual activity or much of sexual activity. You know? uh, now the futile or non-natural desires are the ones that Epicurus is gonna hugely caution, caution you against. So he's much more critical of seeking the satisfied desires that are futile, that go beyond the basic necessities. Things like the desire for wealth, especially unrestrained desire for wealth. Uh, even desire for civic honor, public recognition, esteem and acclaim. And even, even something like science, culture and philosophy, the intellectual development, he's gonna be critical of that because they do not contribute to the basic bodily stability and, and, and the peace of mind that comes from that. But uh, he thinks, it adds complicated uh, elements to your life and it increases in, uh, it increases the chances of pain by the frustration of those futile desires. They're futile because they're not natural because they're not the basic necessities. And the higher you strive, the more you want in terms of civic honor or in a claim, you know, a wealth, the chances, are, the greater the chances that you desire will be frustrated and then pain is the frustration of those desires. So you just increase the quantity of pain for your life. The happy life is the life of this person depicted here, sitting contented with basic necessities, being satisfied and doing that throughout their lives. It's a very austere, simple life. That's the best one because it's the one that minimizes pain and retains the maximization of the most basic natural desires, especially the permanent ones. That's the good life, claims Epicurus. Um, so I, I want to end by looking at a couple of objections uh, to this picture. Uh, objection one is that uh, it seems to make a fundamental mistake 
and regarding the virtues like courage, temperance, benevolence, compassion, and so on, regarding those as merely instrumentally valuable for the sake of bodily pleasures. It does seem like that there's this misunderstanding. If someone's compassionate, uh, it seems that being compassionate is itself something valuable and worth doing. It, it's, it's, it's something good for them and for those that they're compassionate towards. And to you think that developing the capacity of being compassion and compassionate is good only because it leads to bodily pleasures. It seems to be degrading or undermining or making a basic mistake about the status and nature of the intellectual and moral virtues. So that's one objection. Here's a second one though. Uh, this has been known in the literature as the paradox of hedonism. If you really think that the only thing valuable and thus worth, worth pursuing is pleasure, there's this paradox that arises. And the best way of putting the paradox is in terms of an argument. So here's an argument. Uh, premise number one, claim number one, is just the definition of what hedonism is. Hedonism is the view that only pleasure is valuable. The only thing that contributes to your life being happy and worth having. Pleasure is said, nothing else will, will do. Uh, claim number two is a, an important definition about the nature of pleasure. Pleasure is this kind of subjective delight or joy or satisfaction uh, that comes with the attaining of a desirable or valuable object. If there's this thing you're pursuing when you attain it, when you get it, uh, you're gonna derive pleasure. Uh, and pleasure just is the delight in attaining this valuable object. So look at this picture, there's this person getting a PhD, right? This is a PhD kind of outfit. So there is the pleasure that this person is experiencing by attaining the goal of getting a PhD. And pleasure just is that, right? It's the, the kind of satisfaction of or delight in the attainment of something that you're seeking, the satisfaction of a particular desire. Here's another important observation. The more one values the thing one is pursuing, the more pleasure one derives in attaining it. So how, how delightful, how pleasurable is the experience for this person that now that he has attained his goal of a PhD? Well, we can't quite tell, right? He knows, but here's something we can know. The more he values the object, the PhD, the more pleasure he's going to derive in getting it. If he really, he's pretty indifferent, he doesn't really care, he thinks, well, I have to do something with my life, I need to pay bills, right? Like, I don't care, I'll just do that. But right? he has this very indifferent risk, uh, uh, attitude towards the getting of the PhD. Chances are that his, you know, pleasure is going to be pretty, pretty mild, pretty like, yeah, okay, I got it, good, moving on. Uh, however, if it's been his lifelong dream to attain this PhD, which is he thinks is very valuable, important for him, him having a happy life and so on, the more value he bestows upon, the more he values the object of PhD, the more pleasurable it would be for him to attain it, right? That's just an observation of a human psychology. That's how we relate to the world. Uh, but those two observations about pleasure gives rise to this cool conclusion, this paradox for hedonism. Uh, therefore, it follows from these claims that if one only values pleasure and not the objects we're pursuing, like the PhD, uh, one never truly attains it. So think of this person pursuing a PhD. Suppose that he does not think that a PhD is valuable at all. He, what he wants is the pleasure of having a PhD. So his object is the having of a PhD, the pleasure of having a PhD, not the PhD itself. So how pleasurable is it gonna be for him to get the PhD? Not that much, right? Why? Why? Because he doesn't care about the PhD as such. He cares about what he feels when he gets the PhD, right? His the object of his valuing is the wrong one. If what he wants is uh, the PhD, if that's what he values, then there's this natural pleasure that comes in that obtaining the object that you want. But if what you want is just the feeling, and you don't care about the object, then you're not going to have a lot of pleasure in getting it. Perhaps not pleasure at all. Um, and that's the case for anything we seek. If we attain it, we derive pleasure only to the extent that we value it, the object, the thing we're getting. And if we don't value it, we just look at ourselves and look at our experience. The experience is going to diminish very quickly. Perhaps it's not even going to be there. And that experience of pleasure is going to be kind of elusive. It's going to disappear. It's going to, you know, uh, uh, it's not going to be something we can attain. Why? Because we only care about it, and not the object to which it is necessarily attached. Okay, I'll stop here. I'll see you next time.